On Monday, June 25th, 1979, the body of 36-year-old Susan Reinert was found in the trunk of her car, which had been abandoned in the parking lot of a motel near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The single mother of two, who lived more than an hour away, had gone missing days prior, along with her two children, 11-year-old Karen and 10-year-old Michael, who had been seen with her on the evening of Friday, June 22nd. As Pennsylvania state troopers began to explore the suspicious circumstances of Susan's death, they were unsuccessful in identifying any suspects in the weeks after the discovery of her body, and were similarly unsuccessful in locating her two children, who would remain missing. The only reasonable lead left for investigators to pursue, after months of setbacks and dead ends, was a possible link to financial motive. In the months after Susan's murder, investigators would discover that just one month beforehand, she had changed her will, leaving behind everything to her co-worker and boyfriend, William Bradfield, whom she had been seeing privately for over four years. Her estate included more than $800,000 worth of life insurance policies, which had been taken out on Susan's life in the preceding months. While police could find no definitive link leading them to Bradfield, nor his longtime associate Jay Smith, who was already serving a decade-long sentence for numerous offenses, the two would become targets in the media, with journalists exploring the scandalous backstory of both. Bradfield, in particular, would be singled out by Susan's loved ones, who began to file civil suits against the man as his long-term machinations began to be exposed. It turned out that Bradfield had been seeing numerous women at the time of Susan's death, carrying on long-term affairs with a handful of them, most of whom believed him to be their future husband. Susan's brother and ex-husband would allege that Bradfield had swindled Susan out of more than $25,000 in the months before her murder, and in their quest to seek damages, would end up inspiring a criminal investigation into this theft. Bradfield was ultimately convicted of this offense, serving a paltry one-month sentence, but this left the door open for future charges, as the investigation that the FBI had begun to refer to as Sumer short for Susan's murder, continued on. On April 6, 1983, nearly four years after the body of Susan Reinert was found, Bill Bradfield was taken into custody, charged with Susan's murder and the murder of her two children, alongside an unnamed co-conspirator. Under Pennsylvania law, the bodies of the two children were not required to have been found to pursue murder charges as long as prosecutors could establish a desire to cover up the crime. The indictment against Bradfield would subtly allege that he had cooperated with someone, the aforementioned unnamed co-conspirator, and many took that to mean Jay Smith, the former principal of Upper Marion High School that had been linked to this case since its inception. While Smith would not be charged immediately, a curious prospect for those that had been following the case, his presence would remain intrinsically linked to it for the foreseeable future. Over the next several years, this story would continue to play out, providing answers to some of the overarching questions that had been haunting those in the mainline region of Pennsylvania, while ignoring the others, which remain unanswered to this day. This is part three of the mainline murders. Almost immediately after his arrest in April of 1983, Bill Bradfield's fate began to grow uncertain. In his previous trial for theft back in 1981, Bradfield had been represented by John Paul Curran, a well-respected defense attorney in the Philadelphia area. But almost immediately, Curran argued that a postponement of any preliminary hearings was necessary, not only for Bradfield to receive an adequate defense, but because he was likely to drop the case since Bradfield could no longer afford his services. Apparently, years of being unable to find any work had finally taken their toll on the 50-year-old former school teacher. This meant that his case was likely to get pushed onto a public defender. After failing to postpone the preliminary hearings, Curran told the court that Bradfield was being harassed by his fellow inmates, who were not only offering drugs for Bradfield to take to end his life, but were also offering up better living conditions if he were to cooperate with investigators. Curran alleged that this was the work of the prosecution, attempting to tighten the screws on Bradfield and subject him to abhorrent living conditions in order to get him to talk. 
While these allegations were never proven, they were enough to delay the preliminary hearings long enough for Curran to drop the case. The following month, Bill Bradfield would formally request to be represented by a public defender, citing a lack of funds as his rationale. Then, just a couple of weeks later, in June of 1983, Bradfield would enter a plea of not guilty, as he and his new legal counsel began preparing for the start of his trial early that fall. As opening statements began later that year, Bradfield's new defense attorney, Joshua D. Locke, would manage to properly summarize this saga, which had taken nearly half a decade to reach this point, setting the stage for what was undoubtedly going to become a circus of a criminal trial. Locke would tell the court in October of 1983, What you will hear is a bizarre tale probably unlike that experienced by anyone any one of us knows. It almost does a disservice to the English language to characterize this case as bizarre. This word is not enough. Leading up to his trial, Bradfield's attorneys argued that the judge presiding over the case, who had also supervised the grand jury panel that led to Bradfield being charged, had been previously exposed to one side of the case and his judgment came into question. This petition, which was successful, allowed Bucks County Judge Isaac S. Garb to come in and oversee the subsequent trial, which finally began in October of 1983. As the trial got started, the prosecution announced that they were going to be pursuing the death penalty, asking the jury to sentence Bradfield to death if he was found guilty. They also decided to drop several of the charges that Bradfield had been previously accused of, including kidnapping, conspiracy to kidnap, and obstruction of justice, due to issues with the statute of limitations on a few of them, as well as the appeals that would certainly follow. This helped narrow in their case on the three murders, which would help them present a much more focused and streamlined case against Bradfield. Jury selection would turn into a battle of its own, with the defense and prosecution haggling over the merits of dozens of potential jurors over a handful of days, a process that was highlighted throughout several Philadelphia area newspaper articles. Because there was no direct physical evidence linking Bradfield to the crime, this case would end up relying mostly upon witness testimony. Mary Gove, Susan's elderly next-door neighbor, would become one of the most important witnesses for the prosecution early on. She recalled Bill Bradfield being a constant presence at Susan's home, especially between December of 1978 and the week of Susan's death, a time period that correlated to when Susan had inherited money from her deceased mother. Mary had also been one of the last people to see Susan and her children alive, having been the neighbor that witnessed them in their front yard just minutes before leaving at around 9pm on June 22nd, 1979. Mary's statements, which helped establish a long-term relationship between Susan and Bill, were backed up by most of Susan's other loved ones, who recalled her gushing about Bill over an extended period of time. This made his own allegation, that he had no real romantic interest in her, seem that much more puzzling. Proctor Noel, the inmate that Bradfield had allegedly confessed to during his incarceration for theft, also took the stand and recounted what Bradfield had told him. If you recall from the last episode, Bradfield had allegedly told Noel during a game of chess, quote, I was there when they were killed, but I didn't kill them, unquote. In his testimony, Noel described this in detail, quote, He said none of this was meant for the children, only for Susan, but there couldn't be a stone left unturned. He said, we had to tie up all the loose ends, unquote. Bradfield's attorneys would question the motivations of Noel, theorizing that he was looking for leniency on some drug and firearms offenses that he was currently facing. In response, Noel would claim that he wasn't looking to make any such deal, and that, as the father of two children, he was simply trying to do the right thing. It's worth noting that Noel would make headlines a few years later for murdering his girlfriend while under the influence of drugs, which impacted his already fragile mental state. While that doesn't directly impact this case, I thought it was tragic, intriguing, and worth mentioning. Arnold Winder, another inmate that spent time with Bradfield at the State Correctional Institute at Camp Hill, alleged that Bradfield also confessed a similar level of involvement in the case to him. He said that Bradfield had expressed, quote, a desire to kill or hire others to kill Commonwealth witnesses, unquote. When it came time for Bradfield's defense to call witnesses of their own, they ended up relying upon many of the people that had been in Bradfield's corner both before and after the murder of Susan Reinert, 
This included many of his friends and colleagues from Upper Marion High School, who had been with him throughout the weekend of Susan's murder, and even some of his romantic interest from the school. One such name was Vincent Valitis, an English teacher at Upper Marion that had been a longtime associate of Bradfield's. During his testimony, Valitis alleged that Susan Reinert had been having an affair with Jay Smith before her death, which he said he had learned about secondhand through Bradfield. For that reason, he believed that Jay Smith, a convicted criminal, had killed Susan, not Bill. However, during his testimony, Valitis would say that Bradfield knew about this ongoing threat to Susan's life via Jay Smith, and even spoke about it throughout the weekend of Susan's murder, hence him attempting to establish an alibi for himself hundreds of miles away. Susan Myers, another teacher that had actually lived with Bradfield for several years, was another witness called by the defense. During her testimony, she repeated a lot of the information presented by Vincent Valitis, seeming to put the blame for Susan's death at the feet of Jay Smith. Like Valitis, she also claimed to have learned about Susan Reinhardt's affair with Jay Smith through Bill Bradfield, which, considering his reputation for covering up his own affairs through obfuscation, doesn't seem to hold much water. Myers would also testify to Bradfield writing in a diary years before Susan Reinhardt's murder, back in 1974 or 1975, of his desire to murder her for insurance money. Wendy Ziegler, one of Bill Bradfield's former students that had turned into a girlfriend of his, was also called to the stand. Like Bradfield's other friends, she would repeat the party line, deflecting blame onto Jay Smith, but would also testify to holding on to roughly $30,000 for Bradfield over several months. This was the money that he had swindled out of Susan Reinert before her death, and Ziegler holding on to the money for several months, while police were investigating Reinert's murder, seemed to hint at there being some kind of nefarious underlying motive. When it came time for Jay Smith himself to provide testimony, having been called upon as a potential witness, it was Bradfield's legal counsel that ultimately decided against it. Bradfield's lawyers had reportedly grown unsure about what Smith would say if he were actually called to the stand. Apparently, Smith was going to be called to the stand in the closing days of this multi-week trial, but in the lead-up to his testimony, he refused to meet with the legal team of either side both the prosecution and the defense. Smith told the judge that he would refuse to make any secret deals with either side, instead deciding that whatever testimony he provided to the world would be unfiltered. He even told Judge Garb that he would waive his own Fifth Amendment rights should it come to that. The decision to keep Jay Smith from testifying was seen as a panicked move by Bradfield's lawyers, who had laid the blame at Smith's feet throughout the trial. Some speculated that this could be seen as a disastrous move by the jury, who were eager to hear what Smith had to say for himself. Pennsylvania's Deputy Attorney General Richard Gaida, who served as the prosecutor in this case, made a compelling argument for Bradfield to be convicted throughout the trial. In his closing argument, though, he managed to link together all of the evidence that pointed to Bradfield's guilt and describe the scheme that Bradfield and his unnamed co-conspirator had carried out, taking out several life insurance policies on Susan's life before her murder, and making sure that only her body was found. Without Susan's body being found, Bradfield could not collect upon any life insurance policies or inherit whatever she had allocated in her will, which it turns out was her entire estate. Gaida then alleged that the children's bodies were disposed of because they were deemed as disposable or worthless to Bradfield and his co-conspirators. The jury would later describe this closing argument as being incredibly impactful and eliminating any doubts that might have remained. On October 28, 1983, the case was put into the hands of the jury after three weeks of testimony. The jury, which was comprised of nine men and three women from Dauphine County, would spend less than 90 minutes deliberating Bill Bradfield's fate before handing down their decision. Everyone filed back into the courtroom, and Bradfield stood emotionless behind the defendant's table as the verdict was read that Friday afternoon. William S. Bradfield Jr. was found guilty on three counts of first-degree murder, as well as three counts of conspiracy to commit murder. This would give him either the death penalty or life in prison, 
a decision that would remain in the hands of Judge Isaac Garb throughout that weekend. Many of the jurors would speak to reporters, stating that it was relatively easy for them to convict Bradfield, hence the one hour and 25 minutes it took them to come to a decision. They described there being almost no dissent among any of them by the time they got to closing arguments with one member likening Bradfield to cult leader Charles Manson, and another comparing him to the literary monster Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Jurors would later state that Bill Bradfield had personally convinced them of his guilt, having taken the stand for nearly 16 hours throughout the trial and failing to convince anyone of his innocence, which was, ironically, the same thing he had done in J. Smith's trial from 1979. On Sunday, October 30th, everyone was recalled to overhear sentencing, which Judge Garb had decided to take out of the hands of the jury, ruling that the state had failed to provide evidence of aggravated circumstances that could merit the death penalty. Bradfield managed to eke out a small smile when Judge Garb told the court that he wasn't going to sentence the defendant to death, but that smile quickly disappeared when he was given a life sentence for each murder. Because this wasn't a formal sentencing hearing, it was unsure whether or not he would serve these sentences consecutively or concurrently. Over the next year or so, Bradfield would attempt to appeal his conviction, claiming that he had not received a fair trial in Dauphine County and that the jury had favored the prosecution throughout it. Both claims were rejected in December of 1984, and his sentence was upheld. In February of 1985, it was finally decided that Bradfield would serve each of his three life sentences consecutively, meaning one after the other. This meant that he was going to spend the rest of his life behind bars. The second grand jury, which had been impaneled by the state of Pennsylvania in January of 1982, would continue to oversee this case even after Bill Bradfield's conviction, looking into other investigative avenues that remained open to them. Even though Bradfield had been found guilty of conspiring to murder Susan, Karen, and Michael Reinert, the case was still active. Namely, there was the matter of the unnamed co-conspirator that had acted alongside Bradfield, who had allegedly committed the murders and then disposed of the bodies. And then there was the issue of Karen and Michael's bodies, which had yet to be found nearly five years later. To date, investigators had no idea what had happened to the two children, but had decided months prior that, wherever they were, they were likely no longer alive. So in that regard at least, the case was far from closed. Then, there was the giant loose thread which came in the form of Dr. J. Smith, the former principal of Upper Marion High School, who was already serving a lengthy prison sentence for a litany of other offenses. He had been previously linked to this case through some tentative physical evidence, namely matching hair and rug fibers, as well as a comb bearing his army reserve unit, which was found underneath Susan Reinhardt's body. There was even some circumstantial evidence, such as his whereabouts the weekend of Susan's murder, that piqued the interest of many. Smith's violent and bizarre nature notwithstanding, his links to this crime could not be overstated, especially since he had become explicitly linked to it through Bill Bradfield's trial. Even though Smith would continue to deny all of these allegations, suspicion would be cast upon him, as the public spotlight began to transition from Bill Bradfield to himself. Throughout the 1980s, J.C. Smith would apply for parole in his prior convictions, but each time would have his appeals rejected. He was eventually told that he would have to serve out his entire sentence, meaning that he could not taste freedom until June of 1988 at the earliest. This meant that when the grand jury came calling yet again, Smith was unable to turn down their request to talk. In the fall of 1983, following the conviction of Bill Bradfield, Smith would be called to testify in front of the grand jury yet again, this time asserting his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, his fourth time having done so. When asked why, Smith would tell reporters that a grand jury wasn't the proper outlet for him to testify. He wanted to do so in a public forum, where he wouldn't be forced to keep his testimony a secret from the rest of the world. In January of 1984, months after his own conviction, Bill Bradfield would also be called to testify in front of the grand jury. While the details of his testimony were never revealed, with both sides citing the legally mandated secrecy of a grand jury investigation, 
it was theorized by reporters that this round of questioning might be related to Jay Smith's still missing daughter and son-in-law, Stephanie and Edward Hunsberger. In April of 1985, after Bill Bradfield's formal sentence had been meted out, Smith was called again to meet with investigators in the Reinert case. This time, instead of just answering questions, Smith was asked to provide samples of his handwriting. Journalists at the time theorized that this might have had something to do with documents he had written years prior, which may or may not have laid out a plan to murder Susan Reinert. Within weeks, this would seemingly begin to lead somewhere. On June 25th, 1985, six years to the day that Susan Reinert's body was found, Pennsylvania State Police arrested Jay Smith, charging him with three counts of first-degree murder. Since he was already serving a lengthy prison sentence, he was taken into temporary custody and then transferred to a different facility, where he could begin to make regular appearances at court. As he was guided into state police headquarters for processing, Smith told eager reporters that lined the walkway, quote, I had nothing to do with the murders of Susan Reinert and her two children, unquote. The linchpin in this case had been a pair of jailhouse confessions, which seemed incredibly similar to what had happened in the Bill Bradfield case. According to Pennsylvania Attorney General Leroy Zimmerman, Smith had apparently told a fellow inmate, I killed that bitch, and then confessed a similar involvement in the crime to yet another prisoner. When paired together with all of the circumstantial evidence which had built up over the years, this seemed like more than enough to convince the grand jury to pursue charges. And Smith was formally indicted on the six-year anniversary of this case being launched. The prosecution's case against Jay Smith was remarkable in that it was almost identical to that presented against Bill Bradfield, but would have to circle around any possible motive. In Bill Bradfield's case, the motive had been clear, financial gain, but when it came to Smith being involved in the murders, not so much. While that wouldn't be a deterrent in pressing charges, a jury might not be too keen on convicting someone without a motive, which is a real fear for prosecutors to this day. While there was some physical evidence linking Smith to the crime, there wasn't much. A couple of episodes ago, I mentioned there being a forensic link between some hair and rug fibers. Apparently, a strand of hair was found inside of Smith's King of Prussia home, which seemed to be a match for Susan Reinert. But a full-on analysis of the hair sample, conducted by the FBI, would fail to establish any definitive link. A similar thing would happen with fibers from a red carpet from Smith's home, which loosely matched fibers found on Susan's body, but not definitively. The most convincing piece of evidence was a blue comb found underneath the body of Susan Reinert, which bore the insignia of the 79th USAR Calm, J. Smith's Army Reserve Unit. This provided a direct link to Smith, but could be seen as a coincidence to some. Like in the case of Bill Bradfield, the trial of J. Smith would end up relying upon witness testimony. A lot of witness testimony. This included the two inmates that Smith had allegedly confessed to, Raymond Martre and Charles Montioni, as well as witnesses that had testified in Bradfield's trial. This included Bradfield's friends and love interest, who testified to what Bradfield had told them over time regarding Smith his alleged love affair with Susan Reinert, and his later desire to kill her. In total, more than 90 witnesses were called to the stand, and the prosecution presented over 110 pieces of evidence. Throughout the trial, noted crime author Joseph Wombaugh was present, observing everything. Wombaugh had already adapted this saga into a book, 1984's Echoes in the Darkness, but it was believed that Wombaugh was hoping to report on the trial and capitalize upon its popularity for an upcoming TV miniseries. I only mention this because it will become relevant later on. After a three-week trial, the jury broke for deliberation in April of 1986. They would end up spending more than six hours deciding Smith's fate, which was spread out over two days. When they finally returned on Wednesday, April 30th, they did so with a guilty verdict. Jay Smith was found guilty on three counts of first-degree murder, and within days, would be sentenced by the jury to die via electric chair. For many, this was the natural end of the story. Jay Smith had been publicly identified as the unnamed co-conspirator from Bill Bradfield's trial, and seemed to be a natural fit, having been linked to this case and suspected of involvement from the very beginning. Investigators would even state shortly thereafter that, barring any new revelations, their case was closed. 
But as we'd find out, this supposed natural conclusion was not the end of the story, and the truth would not be so cut and dry. In 1984, shortly after Bill Bradfield's conviction for murder, noted crime author Joseph Wamba had released a book about this story titled Echoes in the Darkness. Even though the book had been released before Jay Smith was officially charged in the murders, much less convicted, the book was very much in favor of him having been the actual killer of Susan Reinert and her two children. One could even argue that Wamba's book had built a case almost entirely dependent on Smith being the actual killer, and had gone as far as to describe him in the book as a, quote, goat-eyed sociopath, unquote. Jay Smith's conviction seemed to validate a lot of Wamba's opinions, and a TV miniseries was quickly ordered to adapt the book shortly after his sentencing. Tonight, a CBS miniseries from the pages of Joseph Wamba's controversial bestseller. She left the world the same way she entered, in a fetal position. The victim. She was set chained like a dog. Nobody chains a dog like that. The evidence. The link marks on her body were identical to the chains in these pictures. The manhunt. We've already heard about the devil cult. Peter Coyote, Stalker Channing, Robert Loggia, Cindy Pickett, Peter Boyle, Treat Williams. One of the most bizarre cases in police history. Echoes in the darkness. Next. Even though the case was already infamous throughout the mainline area of Pennsylvania, hence its eventual nickname, the Mainline Murders, this TV miniseries would end up exposing the case to a larger, national audience. As the American public began to learn about this bizarre story for the first time, Jay Smith continued to plead his innocence from the inside of a prison cell. It has been eight years now since the battered and drugged body of Upper Marion school teacher Susan Reiner was found in a car trunk in Harrisburg. Her two children have never been found. Tonight, the notorious case was the subject of the CBS miniseries Echoes in the Darkness, seen here on Channel 10. Bill Baldini reports tonight on the aftermath of the case that still has many unanswered questions. What I'm trying to tell you? Upper Marion High School, just 25 minutes from Philadelphia, a school haunted even today by the 1979 murder of Susan Reinert, which led to the convictions of its former principal, Jay Smith, and former English teacher, William Bradfield. That's what they remember us for, or if they say Upper Marion, or that's where Jay Smith was from. Jay Smith, to this day, says he's sorry about the pain he's caused Upper Marion High, and he claims he was set up. I was an easy target. Everybody was believing that I was involved in this criminal activity. So I was an easy target for Bradfield to frame. Mark Eckert was a member of the student government in the 70s, when Smith was the principal. Dr. Smith was never a vicious or an angry or a mean man. I have trouble believing that Dr. Smith could have committed that crime. Even though he was a little odd, even when you Even though he was odd. Uh, but 58-year-old Smith was convicted of murdering Susan Reinert and her two children, Karen and Michael. The jury said the evidence was circumstantial but overwhelming. Today, Smith is on death row. His case, under appeal. I did not kill Susan Reinert and had nothing to do with her murder or any crimes against her or her children. Nothing whatever. Susan Reinert claimed this man, William Bradfield, promised to marry her. She even made him the sole beneficiary of her $760,000 insurance policy. Today, Bradfield stands convicted of masterminding the murders that Smith committed. He's serving three life sentences. The man who relentlessly pursued both Smith and Bradfield in the courts was prosecutor Rick Guida. My duty is only to prosecute those people who I believe can be convicted using credible evidence in the case, and I've heard nothing since that time to have changed uh, my opinion. You think they are guilty? I wouldn't have prosecuted them unless I, unless I did. The loudest echo in the darkness, however, was, and still is, what happened to the Reiner children, Karen and Michael, last seen with their mother. Their mother's body was found in 1979, but their bodies were never found. Do you ever think of those two children? Every day. The police say this case will never be closed until the Reiner children are found dead or alive. Bill Baldini, Channel 10 News. For the next several years, Jay Smith would attempt to appeal his sentence, even going as far as requesting a new trial by citing prosecutorial misconduct. But all of those requests were denied, 
and in 1987, Smith was formally sentenced to death via electric chair. Smith would continue to deny any involvement in the Reinert murders, and would continue to claim that he had been framed by Bill Bradfield, who he says planted specific pieces of evidence to make him look guilty, such as the comb found underneath Susan Reinert's body. It wasn't until 1989 that a court decided to actually revisit the case, and during their analysis, discovered some glaring holes in the prosecution's case. For starters, it appears like certain evidence had been withheld from the defense by a single state trooper who had been overseeing the investigation for several years. This officer, Jack Holtz, had actually been paid $50,000 by Joseph Wambaugh, the author of Echoes in the Darkness, in order to disclose confidential information both before and after the trial. Not only was the release of this information prohibited, but so was the notion of state troopers receiving any kind of cash payment from unapproved sources. This was a tremendous injustice, regardless of Smith's guilt, and one that allowed him to seek another trial. In December of 1989, the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court ruled in Smith's favor, vacating his sentence and granting him a new trial. Their ruling stated that the witness testimony used to convict him was hearsay, namely the witness testimony provided by those with a vested interest in overturning Bill Bradfield's conviction, his friends, lovers, etc. The Supreme Court ruling also cast aspersions on the prosecutor in the case, Pennsylvania's Deputy Attorney General at the time, Richard Gaida, who had since resigned in disgrace and had been incarcerated for cocaine distribution. During his own trial, he had admitted to using cocaine while pursuing charges against Smith, and his prior conduct was now called into question. The following year, 1990, Jay Smith would waive his right to a speedy trial, agreeing to stay incarcerated until this matter could be fully investigated by the state and his own attorneys who were working to grant him permanent freedom. This saga would carry on throughout 1992, with the Pennsylvania Supreme Court eventually finding that not only had the prosecution failed to try their case with integrity, utilizing testimony that was hearsay, but they had actually withheld evidence from the trial that might have been valuable to the defense. They found that this evidence, which was discovered in the attic of state trooper Jack Holtz, could have feasibly swayed the jury in favor of Smith's innocence. Throughout 1992, Jay Smith would begin to feel optimistic, and that feeling was vindicated when, in September of that year, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decided to rule entirely in his favor. Not only was Smith's entire murder conviction vacated, but the Supreme Court found that the prosecution had tried their case with improper conduct, so much so that Smith would not even be facing a retrial, at least not with the current set of circumstances, players, and evidence, which would impede upon double jeopardy laws. Over the next two decades, the state would not retry this case, allowing Jay Smith to live out the rest of his life as a free man. Over the next decade, the still-convicted Bill Bradfield would skirt a number of court rulings, refusing to pay back $25,000 that he owed to the estate of Susan Reinert. Through a number of excuses, the killer tried to squirm his way out of repaying the money that he had swindled out of the murdered woman, but her family members would continue on with the suit not in an effort to enrich themselves, but rather as a matter of principle. It wasn't until August of 1996, more than 13 years after the suit was filed, that it was finally settled, and the money was taken out of a bank account controlled by Bill Bradfield and his long-term love interest, Joanne Aitken. Meanwhile, Jay Smith would file a couple of lawsuits of his own, not only against the state for concealing evidence during his trial, but also against noted crime author Joseph Wambaugh. Smith was alleging that Wambaugh had not only defamed him, but conspired with law enforcement to frame him for the three murders that he was originally convicted of. The lawsuit against the state would get snuffed out in 1998, and the lawsuit against Wambaugh would follow in 2000. Smith would end up spending the decade afterward in relative obscurity. On January 16th, 1998, 64-year-old Bill Bradfield, who had been incarcerated for over a decade, was found unresponsive in his cell by a couple of guards during their afternoon rounds. After several attempts to resuscitate him failed, Bradfield was taken to a nearby hospital, but was pronounced dead of cardiac arrest just after 5 p.m. He was believed to have died via sudden heart attack, taking with him any secrets that he might have still had. However, from his death, 
A tiny glimmer of hope for answers would appear in the form of a single Polaroid photo found in his possessions. The photograph, which was found alongside some coded writings and other items, seemed to have been developed in 1986, years after his conviction, and appears to have been set in a wooded area. The photograph itself is centered around a very distinct looking stone, which may or may not be a marker of sorts. You can see trees in the background and leaves on the ground surrounding the stone, which investigators believe could be the impromptu burial plot for Karen and Michael Reinert. Since their bodies had yet to be found more than 20 years later, it was theorized that this could have been a picture of their gravesite, eternalized by Bill Bradfield, who died without ever explaining himself or his actions. In the years that have passed, many of those connected to this case have since passed away. Kenneth Reinert, the ex-husband of Susan Reinert and the father of her two children, passed away in June of 2002. He left behind a wife, stepdaughter, and a son, but died without knowing what happened to his oldest two children. Meanwhile, Jay Smith, the former principal of Upper Marion High School, who had been convicted of murdering the three Reinerts in 1986, but whose sentence was vacated in 1992 and never retried, would go on to write a couple of independent books about this case. He would even remarry in 2002, but he too would fall prey to Father Time, passing away on May 12, 2009, at the age of 80. At the time of his death, his involvement in this story had yet to be cleared up, as did his potential involvement in the 1978 disappearance of his daughter and son-in-law, Stephanie and Edward Hunsberger. To date, those two remain missing, with their last known sighting having been in February of 1978. Upper Marion High School would struggle to escape the massive shadow cast by this case, even decades after the fact. Students and parents alike in the region had a hard time separating the name Upper Marion from the scandalous story that had unfolded throughout the 1980s. Murder for hire, fraud, love affairs, drugs, theft, etc. For years, graffiti would mark the exterior walls of Upper Marion, stuff like Satan's Place, and the reputation of this story was hard to escape. The case itself has remained a unique piece of Pennsylvania lore, having inspired the largest, and most expensive at the time, investigation in state history, in addition to a number of books and even a network TV miniseries. For years, prosecutors throughout the state joked about the case being cursed, and its mostly unfinished nature seems to be symbolic of that. Investigators have remained pretty tight-lipped about the current state of their investigation, claiming that this is still an open case, albeit inactive. Shortly after J. Smith's death in 2009, investigators would tell reporters that it was possible that someone named in prior news reports, likely someone that I've mentioned throughout this series, might have known more about the case than they've let on over the years. Brian Krauss, then a Pennsylvania state trooper, told reporters about the possibility of someone else having been involved in this case. Quote, I would certainly say that there is a possibility of a third person out there, a probability. With the time that has elapsed since this case started, almost four decades, it remains unlikely that things will change anytime soon. But crazier things have happened in true crime in recent memory. Deathbed confessions, previously unheard of advancements in forensic testing, and even the discovery of bodies years after they had been hidden or disposed of. Hopefully, time will help bring resolution in this case. As of 2020, several questions remain unanswered. Who actually killed Susan Reinert and disposed of her body? What happened to her two children? Similarly, what happened to Jay Smith's missing daughter and son-in-law, who, like the missing Reinert children, have been missing for over 40 years now? What kind of answers did these two men, Bill Bradfield and Jay Smith, take with them to the grave? Karen and Michael Reinert, who were just 11 and 10 years old when they went missing in June of 1979, would now be in their early 50s. Despite their bodies never being found, they were officially declared dead on June 22nd, 1986, seven years to the day after they were last seen, the time allotted to missing persons under Pennsylvania state law. Because no one has seen or heard from them since 1979, that ruling still stands, even though their true fate remains unknown. The stories of Susan, Karen, and Michael Reinert, as well as those of Edward and Stephanie Hunsberger, remain unresolved. 
Thank you all for listening to Unresolved. Believe it or not, this is a story that I was originally hoping to cover in a single episode. But when I started writing the script for episode 1, I realized that there was no way in hell I could do that. At least not without admitting some really important plot points, which I think are really integral for this story. All in all, I just hope that I did this story justice. It's an insanely interesting one, and one that I'm glad I took a little extra time to focus on. For reference, this episode alone has more than 100 individual sources, which is just insane for an episode of this length. But I'm really glad that I did all of the reading and research that I did. This is really just an insane rabbit hole of a story. If you would like to learn more about myself or the podcast, make sure to visit our website, unresolved.me, or follow along with the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can even support the show by visiting our store at unresolved.threadless.com, or by visiting our Patreon page and becoming a patron of the podcast. Any help you can give is greatly appreciated, and I always try to make it worth your while to do so. Also, if you enjoy listening to Unresolved, make sure to check out the Unresolved live stream over on Get Vocal, which I've been doing for the last month or so. The live streams are a lot of fun for me, and they're a unique way to explore some past Unresolved stories with some friends of mine. Just last week, I had on true crime writer Lana McCall to discuss the Kyron Horman case, and she brought some really interesting insights. And on a few of the other live streams, I've had on my friends from True Crime Movie Club, Jesse, Dan, Jeff, and Mike. This next week, I'll be discussing the Long Island serial killer with a really special guest, and I promise that you will not want to miss that. Before I wrap up this episode, I would like to quickly thank the producers of this podcast, who support the show each month through Patreon. These wonderful people are Maggie James, Roberta Jansen, Ben Crocom, Peggy Ballarda, Quill Carter, Laura Hannon, Victoria Reed, Gabriella Bromley, Damian Moore, Amy Hampton, Stephen Wilson, Scott Meesey, Marie Vankland, Scott Patzold, Astrid Nyer, Lori Rodriguez, Ime McGregor, Danny Williams, Sydney Scotton, Sarah Moscaritolo, Sue Kirk, Thomas Ahern, Seth Morgan, Marion Welsh, Patrick Loxo, Kelly Jo Hapgood, Alyssa Lawton, Meadow Landry, Rebecca Miller, Tatum Bautista, Gravity Head Zero, Aaron Piles, Joe Wong, Tunia Elzinga, Consuelo Moreno, Travis Sepko, Jacinda B, and Jared Midwood. Thank you all so, so much. I know I say this all the time, but words cannot express how grateful I am that everyone out there just continues to listen and support this podcast. Thank you for doing so. I believe I'll be taking next week off of this podcast to attend to some personal business and try to catch up on some bonus content for Patreon. But I'll be back with another unresolved story before you know it. Until then, I hope you all stay safe, stay healthy, and I will talk to you later.